Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Jeff McCoy, Pacific Legal Foundation staff attorney. And we also have Gerald Clift, who is a 2014 candidate for uh, Solano County Supervisor, running on a, a libertarian-ish, this was an independent race, right? Yes, it was. Libertarian-ish uh, ticket. Welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you. China has been in the process of trying to support the yuan, trying to keep the value of the yuan high in order to gain respect uh, from the International Monetary Fund and become part of the of the reserve uh, currency systems for the for the uh, you know the global global banking and so forth. So they they've been doing exactly what Trump ostensibly would want them to do: keep the value of the of the yuan high in order to uh, slow down Chinese exports and encourage U.S. exports to China. So his accusations were just put patent nonsense from the beginning. Now, either he finally figured that out or got some good advice from economists, uh, or he just decided it's, you know, I'm elected and I don't have to, you know, I don't have to play to that, play that tune anymore. I'm not sure which. But yeah, I think the flip in this case was in the right direction. Yeah, I didn't have a problem with it. I just, like I said, I'm more concerned that he seems to have so little interest in researching any of these issues that... He tweets before he talks, things. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, the next one, the Fed bubble finance. He, may, he said, we're in a big, fat, ugly bubble when it comes to uh, the uh, stock market, to uh, monetary expansion, to uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, monetary manipulation of the U.S. economy. That's what he said during the campaign. Now, he's saying, you know what, I kind of like, I think, I think Janice, uh, uh, that uh, Yellen is doing a, a fairly decent job as a Federal Reserve Chairman, and I, I'm seriously considering reappointing her to another term uh, at, the, uh, at, at the head of the Fed. Flip in the right direction, flip in the wrong direction. I, I would say flip in the wrong direction. I, I do think that we do have a lot of bubbles in the economy right now. I mean, there's going to be a car loan bubble, the student loan bubble, the idea that the Federal Reserve should keep manipulating uh, the economy by playing with interest rates, I, I'm not a fan of. And uh, I don't particularly think Janet Yellen's done a great job. I don't know what, how you feel about it. But. Well, I'm in the process of buying a house, so this has been... <laughs> oh, so, you want, you, so you want to keep those interest rates down. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, and well, and that, but that's, I think, part of the thing is it, the fact that, that this is so uh, affecting part of my life. That, that, um, that there is so much control. I think that's one of the <laughs> the concerns is, um, ag again, that someone in Washington can affect my life so much because of the, <laughs> the interest rates. And yeah, I mean, as a policy matter, uh, interest rates, I mean, it's a complicated matter. I mean, on a personal level, like you said, maybe I want them a little bit low so I can lock in that mortgage interest rate. <laughs> but um, but ultimately, that, that speaks to the, the power of the federal government. Well, I mean, the thing you have to understand is that the interest rate <coughs> is simply the price of money. And so when the Fed manipulates interest rates, interest rates up or down, it is, well, it's price controls. Mm -hmm. It's just a price control on capital. And the, we, we learned during the, uh, the Nixon years that wage and price controls don't work very well. Uh, who, who, you guys aren't old enough to remember the wind buttons with Jerry Ford, whip inflation now. Uh, but it took, it took uh, Paul Volcker and uh, a heavy-handed 10-15% uh, interest rate in order to whip inflation. That's what it took. We're in a situation right now where we've had inflation. It just hasn't showed up in consumer prices. It showed up in asset markets. It showed up in uh, loans. We have corporations who are borrowing heavily to buy back their own stock or to increase dividends. We have uh, uh, loans going for a lot of non-productive purposes, but not a whole lot of productive purposes. Sooner or later, uh, corporations are going to become so over leveraged that they can't do that anymore. At which point, when interest rates do go up, it's going to hurt really, really bad, and they can't hold them down forever. So I think he had it right in the first place when he said we're in a, a big, fat, ugly bubble, uh, and it's time to rein that in. And Janet Yellen ain't the person that's going to do it. She's going to play the same old monetarist Keynesian game that she, you know, that that uh, Bernanke uh, started, and, and that uh, that Greenspan even fell mm -hmm. uh, fell uh, victim to. So I, you know, I think that's a flop in the wrong direction. I agree. Okay. Next one, the uh, export import import bank. He said that that's nothing but a uh, welfare for Boeing and uh, GE during the campaign. Now he thinks it's a great thing for uh, boosting exports. 
Yeah, definitely flipping the wrong direction. I mean, this uh, it's not there's no better poster child for crony capitalism and you're supposed to be draining the swamp. You would think you'd want to get rid of this ability of the federal government to pick and choose winners and losers in the market. I mean, even uh, you know, Bernie Sanders railed against us on the campaign. The Koch brothers did some ads to support him on this position. It's uh I mean, I should, I would say I'm shocked, but I, I don't think uh, Trump really has much of a compass ideologically anyway. So, well, not a moral compass, and certainly not a popular <laughs> compass, political compass. Well, and yeah, and I, I think that's one of the, one of the the issues is you, you mentioned that he he went in with training the swamp and then appointed a bunch of uh, a Goldman people, yes, yeah, but, yeah, or people who have been in Washington for a long time, and, yeah, and he, so. he appointed the alligators to drain the swamp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, next one uh, is uh, NATO's obsolescence. During the campaign, he said, NATO is obsolete. The Germans and the French and the rest of the members of the alliance have not been paying their fair share uh, since World War II, which is absolutely true. Uh, we've been bearing the, the majority of the, of the cost of NATO from the get. That hasn't changed. And he said, that's going to change Germany and Europe and the rest of the NATO alliance. They're, those comp uh, countries are going to have to step up to the plate. Now, I don't know that uh, Germany or France or anybody is, uh, is put, putting any more money into NATO, but all of a sudden now, NATO is, is just fine. Let's admit more co countries like Belarus into NATO so that we can subsidize not just Western Europe, but Eastern Europe as well. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't like the idea that uh, American children are going to be pulled off to, into a war that Congress doesn't get to vote for just because we're, we're part of NATO. and. I is especially alarming that he, like you said, he not only has flipped in supporting it, but now it wants to add new countries to the to NATO. I, I believe uh, was it two weeks ago they just passed uh, legislation. Was yeah. it? Yeah, um, just major flip <laughs> flop. <laughs> and in the wrong direction. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the the last one, the uh, dropping well, cruise missiles onto an airport causing no damage but a lot of bangs in Syria as a result of the alleged uh, gassing of, uh, of uh, Syrian people or Syrian co combatants by, by Assad, uh, followed by dropping the, large, the, the mother of all bombs, the Moab, a uh, huge bomb, uh, on uh, a cave complex which actually was built by the CIA back when uh, Osama bin Laden was one of our, our allies when Afghanistan was, uh, was rebelling against Russia. Uh, a show of force, something to get the uh, military industrial complex off his case, what? <laughs> I don't know about this one. Well, I, I just, I think, I think it, it, this was a flip uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, in, in, during the Obama administration, he, uh, he cr heavily criticized President Obama's um, uh, approach to Syria, and now he seems to not only be continuing that approach, but ramping it up. And I think before the United States gets involved in any uh, foreign conflict, uh, it has to be clear about both the interests that it's protecting uh, and the uh, the goals. Because without it, um, you have continuously long wars, which you don't have a completion date because you don't have any goals of what constitutes victory. Yeah, and, and, and particularly in, in Syria, there are no good guys. No, I, I mean, Assad, I, I kind of doubt whether he was responsible for the gassing because it was not in his interest to, you know, to bring that kind of attention upon himself. <coughs> he could have been. I, you know, there's no way of knowing, but I don't trust the intelligence reports that are coming back uh, laying the blame on him. But he's still a bad guy. I mean, he's a dictator, has been, uh, he's a, you know, a hereditary dictator from his father. Not a good guy. But his opponents are al-Qaeda mm -hmm. and ISIS. Who are you know they're, they're the worst kind of butchers, uh, Islamic radicals that you can possibly cut, dream of. They're the people who cut people's heads off on 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 on, on iPods. Yeah, I, I don't know what he could possibly be thinking. I mean, that was one line of hope during the campaign. I was like, at least he's not as hawkish as Hillary. And then yeah, and then I, he has I, something you know, like during this. the campaign, I said I, I absolutely cannot vote for Hillary because she is saying that she's going to go and do to Syria what she already did to Libya and uh, Iraq, which was terrible in terms of U.S. interests. Yeah, and there was some hope. You know, he met with Tulsi Gabbard right after yeah. he got elected, and we're thinking, oh, maybe she'll I'm just knock wondering, some sense I'm just in. wondering if the, uh, the, uh, the K Street uh, lobbyists, uh, particularly from uh, the, the defense industry, got to him and said, hey, you want to uh, you know, you avoid uh, mm, bad things happening to the 
to your uh, your presidency, you better get on board with uh, supporting the war effort in in uh, in the Middle East. Well, you know that that would make sense. I mean, what's going to be our strategy? There was an article just a year ago from the LA Times about how um, militias armed by the Pentagon were fighting militias armed by the CIA in Syria. You know, we just have no control of what's going on. We just keep flowing money and weapons into the worst <coughs> possible people we can find because they'll take it. And then we just hope that magically the whole situation is going to end with Assad gone and a perfect democracy. It just I can't imagine it not being a lot worse by our intervention there. So that's another uh, flop in the, in the direction. That, so that was a score? horrible flop. That was maybe, probably the worst. Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, one, uh, yeah, one good, four bad. Yeah. Okay. So much for the libertarian Trump supporters. <laughs> I, I, I never understood that to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bill O'Reilly finally got fired. Justified or not? I, I think it was Based, justified. On, 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 two, on, on two issues. One, the the, uh, the alleged uh, sexual uh, uh, harassment charges and to the fact that he was just a, a noisy blower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, I would say on both. I mean, um, he there was a lot of women that have come forward now. You know, it's it's not just uh, one person. It's but uh, you know, in terms of his value as a commentator, I mean, what was he really selling us? It just he kind of yelled at the camera. He didn't really have any good values. He attacked uh, assault weapons and wanted to vastly expand the federal roles, federal government's role in education. I'm not really sure what he was doing being the uh, conservative talk host all these years. Well, I, I th do think it's firing does speak to the, the, the power of market forces because I, I don't remember the exact amount, but many of his sponsors pulled out as a result of these allegations. Um, and, and as a result, uh, Fox News fired him. And I think that um, that shows uh, what 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 market forces can can achieve? Um, because uh, I, I mean, he the Fox News um, presumably kept him on because he got good ratings, which meant more advertisers. And when um, when he did something or there was reports of, of him doing something um, uh, something bad, then the advertisers were able to look at this and and say we're not going to support you financially anymore, and it resulted in his firing. With a big payout, but that's, that's well, I, I, that, that's probably to avoid some litigation. Or, yeah. But it's been a major shakeup over there recently. <laughs> well, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what finally materializes at Fox News. Yeah. I, I kind of like his successor. What's his name? Tucker Carlson. Yeah, Tucker Carlson. He's he's kind of a good guy. I a lot better than a lot better than Bill O'Reilly. Sure. So we'll we'll see how that works out. <laughs> at least he does have a little bit of a libertarian bent to him. A little him, bit, a yeah. little bit, and and uh, you know, at least he's intelligent. And yeah, well, that's that's uh, nice too. Just take the you know the populist blowhard line, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Um, Assemblyman, uh, California Assemblyman uh, Miguel Santiago of LA uh, has introduced, and it's, got a, it's, it's passed through committee, uh, an assembly bill to raise the standard of proof in cops lying about uh, uh, cases from 50% uh, probability, in other words, more likely than not, that's the, the standard that exists now, to clear and convincing. Now, what that would do, of course, is it would make it a lot more difficult to convict a cop by lying about uh, their policing uh, activities. Uh, do we really need more uh, things to protect cops from, bad, from their, their bad behavior? Well, I, I mean, I think that public officials should be held to a higher standard um, uh, than uh, be, because they have so much power and influence. Um, and and uh, from what I know of this bill, it, um, as you said, it would would probably make it harder um, to uh, to hold accountable those uh, those police officers uh, that are not doing their duty, <laughs> not protecting the public. Um, and I think that, that that is an unfortunate thing. Like like I said before, uh, police officers. Um, they need to be held to a higher standard uh, because of, of the amount of power that they, they have. All public officials should be held to a higher standard, and this, this bill um, ends up holding them to a lower standard. I mean, they've already got the thin blue line. Cops won't yep. write each other out. They've already got uh, police union protection, which have written union rules that make it really, really difficult. To get their disciplinary for, records, for, right? For, yeah, to get anything on your disciplinary record or to even make it, uh, make it publicly accessible. And number three, they've got uh, the... the uh, social conservative support of a whole lot of social conservative uh, voters who think that cops can do no wrong. Uh, and, uh, you know, and at class, they've got the, the advantage of prosecutors being very, very reluctant to, to prosecute cops even when they are uh, clearly uh, in violation of the law in one way or another. So you've got an awful lot of things that they've got going for them to protect them uh, from uh, 
being uh, held responsible for any any uh, bad actions. They need this on top of all of that. Yeah, definitely not. I I'm I shouldn't say shocked, but I I would be. <laughs> I'm concerned that this is basically a solution to a problem that doesn't exist, and we're just going to make it even harder to get the bad cops off the street, which you know is, is bad for good cops as well when we're making it harder and harder to get the problem cops um, out of power. We, we, it's easier to associate them all as being bad people. Yeah, well, and of course, I mean, it's not all the cops' problem. Part of the problem is we have way too many uh, unnecessary and counterproductive laws on the books that yeah. they are expected to enforce. And so as a natural result of that, they are enforced selectively. That's true. And they're enforced selectively upon quite often the poorest and the most uh, uh, defenseless elements of society. Uh, there's a reason why uh, drug use among all uh, races is approximately the same, but more blacks go to prison than, than whites. It's because there's, you know, it's easier to do that and cops get by with it. Um, so, uh, you know, part of the problem is, is laws that are, are way too officious and way too, way too burdensome. Very part true. of it is that the kind of person, not, 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 not always, but in many cases, the kind of person who is attracted to a job as a police officer may have some uh, sociopathic uh, control issue tendencies to begin with. Oh yeah, no, they, they, I mean, it attracts people that want the power yeah. and uh, I, Unfortunately, there is the thin blue line you talk about where no one wants to ride each other out. I mean, the uh, incident in Oakland recently when I want to say three police chiefs had to resign for in connection with the um, underage prostitute that a bunch of police uh, police officers were using in the Oakland department, San Francisco, and a few other than the Bay Area. There's no way there weren't a bunch of cops that didn't know about that that kept their mouth shut. I mean, it was so widespread. And we uh, unfortunately are probably going to have a lot of the cops that involved with that stay on the force. Even in the incident um, a few years ago where that uh, child was shot uh, holding a toy gun, his previous... No, up in the North Bay. Yeah, yeah the pre previous department had fired him and said, you know, this guy should never touch, hold a gun. But that disciplinary record didn't even go f from that police department to the next police department he went to, much less the public. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next topic, this is something that's confused me for a long time, the whole idea of net neutrality. Uh, so let, let's kind of dive into net neutrality. Is that something that is moving? Is it, first of all, what does it mean? Um, well, so it, it, net neutrality, um, as I understand it, is that um, when data is being sent, um, what net neutrality would do, laws that require net neutrality, would mean that you cannot, uh, that an internet service provider cannot discriminate uh, against any um, any piece of data, so they could not um, allow one piece of data from somewhere to go faster, connect faster. They have to treat it all the same. Um, one of the crit critiques um, that the people who are in favor of net neutrality, uh, one issue that they, they try and, and focus on, they say is, well, um, when I have uh, an internet service provider, I expect, I don't want the my internet service provider to decide which websites I will get to go to quickly and which they will slow me down, um, I should be able to equally access all of them. Um, one of the issues that I think is is that I think the underlying problem is that there's their uh, current regulations just prevent uh, more internet service providers from providing internet. Um, there are, I think, uh, good reasons to, for some people don't use the internet for that much and so it would be beneficial to them if they only check their email um, that they don't need a fast internet connection to every website. They just need a fast internet connection to email, um, and it, it's possible that you the do that with AOL Viber, <laughs> right? And so, and you could provide a cheaper service. Uh, uh, an internet service provider could provide a cheaper service for only people who use um, email. Um, again, like, but like I said, I but think if you're using Netscape or other data hogs, uh, you know, streaming, uh, you know, uh, 3D movies then you probably need a little bit faster speed in order to have a good viewing experience. And why not charge Netscape a higher price for, well, yeah. being, a, for being a media hawk? Yeah, or charge, or charge if, you, if, you need all of the, if you need fast speeds to, to watch movies, then you can purchase that plan. But like I said, part of the problem is that there are so many uh, monopolies or duopolies and internet service providers um, that that people don't have that choice where they can't choose to say, okay, well, I want an internet service provider who's going to provide 
me uh, fast access to the websites I need and I don't care about the rest of it. Um, right now, you only have one or two choices. Um, in, in each, in each uh, particular locality? Yeah, yeah. In, in each. Now, is that a, re a regulatory failure as well? Uh, regulatory uh, regulations make it difficult for more than uh, one or two uh, ISPs to operate? I, I think there's a lot of factors. I do think the regulations don't help. I know that, uh, I mean, <coughs> there's, I know that some municipalities have started their own broadband service, and I, I'm sure that, that provides some disincentives to allow competitors in once the, the municipality has started their really? own. Really? Municipalities have started doing that? Yeah, yeah. And I, I know, um, <laughs> coming from Colorado, I know, I think Boulder had started um, to, to do that. And so I think, um, ultimately, I think the answer is to, to, to look at it, and, and the goal should be uh, more competitors, because that would help um, alleviate uh, many of these issues that, that, and many of the concerns that people have um, with a lack of net neutrality. Um, and, and, and that, I think, having more competitors would allow, well, not only would allow uh, greater competition, but it would allow more particularized services uh, to, to people who use the Internet. Well, it seems to me that the, the, the rapid uh, weed-like growth of the Internet for the last uh, uh, 20, 20, 25 years has been due to the fact that it is an entirely new uh, area of business with essentially no regulation whatsoever. It uh, started out with a, a, you know, a, a laissez-faire regulatory environment, no regulation. Uh, whoever provides the, be the best value uh, at the best price is the one that gets the business. That's what allowed the, the internet to become the huge uh, presence that it is in the, uh, in the economy. Now that it's there, now that it's big, and now that uh, you've got uh, media titans, uh, you know, some of the most valuable companies on the uh, stock exchange, Google's and uh, uh, so on, Facebook's and so on, all internet companies, uh, one way or another, now the tendency seems to be to uh, bring in regulatory, regulatory uh, uh, pro uh, protocols that protect the people who have established themselves. <laughs> And that, that does seem, uh, that seems to be a common theme. Um, we, the Pacific Legal Foundation actually just put on an event today um, entitled Bottleneckers about the situation where um, certain industries get developed um, and then those in those industries start asking for occupational li licenses um, because uh, that helps uh, keep those that are currently uh, in the uh, occupation uh, <coughs> And it help, and it prevents others from from it, obtaining occupational licenses or entering the industries. And so, just as you, you said, it, it seems to be that there's a development, there's a new industry, um, and then those in the industry uh, request regulations in order to uh, to solidify protect, the, protect their established yes. position. <laughs> yeah. uh, we we can't let 420 uh, go by without <laughs> uh, a uh, a speculation. This, here's a speculation. There are now more 18 to 34 year olds living at home in their base, parents' basement than living with a spouse. We're also seeing a time when uh, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana and other uh, legalized use of marijuana has uh, uh, mushroomed uh, or gone up in smoke all, all across <laughs> the United States. Is there a correlation? Uh. I would say no. It's uh, funny as it would be, but uh, so supposedly, correlation, not causation. I would say correlation, not causation. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, more than half the people in the full-time workforce have used marijuana. So uh, I don't think it's making them so lazy they have to sit in their parents' basement. Um, I, I think one one issue uh, is especially is that there, there was a huge push uh, for everybody um, our age to go to a four-year university. Um, and while four-year university can be very beneficial, um, we're both lawyers, we couldn't have done it without, um, I, I don't think that it is the... Well, you could have. You could have you know, studied under whatever that old-fashioned way. That's, that's true, yeah. an apprenticeship. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in some states... That. California actually allows that. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that there are, there are other opportunities that have, have lost focus, and I, especially in... in uh, trades, and I think that, that the push uh, for for your university is especially backed up by uh, basically low interest subsidized loans. For well, yeah, but uh, the, the plethora of loans has increased the cost of college education, making the repayment of the loans, low interest or not, 
unaffordable and making people live in their yeah. parents' basement. Exactly. That's the show. We'll see you again <laughs> next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint on YouTube, on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, and on the web at www.accesssacramento.org. Thank you very much for being on the show. See you again sometime. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.